This is part two of our topic on regulatory technology, in short, RegTech. So I do have a concern and I've always, uh, in any of my speaking engagement, highlight that machines still need to be taught how to use it properly so that we can be effective in the way that we fight financial crime. So on that note, um, I'll start with Mark on the, what do you think that we could do to prepare our teams in making use of the tools that we purchase, uh, which self-proclaim to be the cutting-edge technology powered by generative AI? If I ruled the world, you would have a soft rollout where you would start with two systems which you could monitor to see the impact of um, side by side and that is exactly the sort of expense that would drive IT directors and board members completely batty because you want to see what the practical output would be in terms of why have you installed RegTech? If it's to save money to make more efficient use of what the information is out there, which are perfectly reasonable um, things to do, then why would you keep the people that you may be trying to replace? The short answer is you actually need, as we've discussed before, the people in there to help the machine learning, to help the AI. Sorry if I'm interchanging phrases which are not quite correct, I'm sure I'll be picked up on that. But effectively, you need to make sure they're doing the job that is expected of them. You're going to have to take the old-fashioned approach as if you're clearing a minefield. You're going to have to proceed very carefully. You're going to have to take it one step at a time, and you're going to have to put sufficient distance between yourself and your implementation team in case they find a mine the old-fashioned way. None of that is popular. It's incredibly hard to do, and you're, it's a really big ask of any team that you're putting in that position. You know, one of the things about uh, digital transformation is that typically a lot of these legacy systems have been around for ages and some of the people who were very familiar with the systems have either retired or um, made redundant because, you know, new things have come in. One, one of the things that I believe that we should also look at is how to ensure that there is sustainability and there are still people who are available or around to ensure that the systems, people, there's someone who actually knows the system uh, that they are going to put together. Um, I think the one thing that, yeah, Nigel, uh, to you is, yeah, you are the expert in our group here about artificial intelligence or non-intelligence. And so, therefore, um, what would be some of your advices in how we can select a proper or the appropriate tool for our anti-money laundering or fighting financial crime um, compliance. We need to go back with what you've just been saying to the point long before anyone started talking about any algorithmic analysis in any form whatsoever. We have, a, you were talking about legacy systems. This has been a problem across the financial sector for the last 40 years. It started because Companies, providers of data software, be it for keeping account records or whatever, all operated their own proprietary database systems, which did not talk to anything else. 20 odd years ago, I stood in a technology conference in the Middle East and told banks that they should say to their providers that the providers should get their act together and have a common database structure with database in, with, with data interchanges, ideally based on something like XML, which, it, which the bank would then be able to use without having to throw away old technology or old, old software, and more importantly, without having to keep a box in the corner of the old computer to be able to access data which could not be cost-effectively migrated to a new system. Technology companies hated me. 
15 years later, companies started talking about big data. But when they started talking about big data, they weren't talking about removing proprietary information. They were talking about moving everything to one proprietary information system. Um, so that's one of the reasons why when you're looking at this idea of there being a problems with legacy systems, it's why you've still got that problem. But that's not specifically the problem that we're getting in relation to RegTech. The proprietary systems that exist are not where RegTech is generally looking for its information, except in relation to existing customers. And that's something that people have already solved the interchange um, problem with. It's looking at outside databases. And then the problem we have is that it's gathering information from multi, multiple sources and trying to reconcile data formats. And technologically, that's quite hard to do. So when you say you're looking at the staff to be able to interrogate the, the old databases and find information, yes, you do still need them. Precisely because nobody has had the courage to say to the providers, this is the data, the, the backend database we're going to use. This is the encryption we're going to use. You work, work within those parameters or we're not buying your product. And that's what banks should have been saying for the last 40 years. We should be saying it now. This is the this is the system we have. This is the system we prefer. If you want to provide your products, they're not solutions. If you want to provide your products to us, you have to integrate with our technology, not the other way around. I think on the part about legacy system, the other thing that um, having been through quite a few digital transformation exercises myself is on quality of data legacy data what people tend to forget is that artificial intelligence or not um, the machines will need to be taught and we need to label the data before they can even be used and data labeling uh, requires humans intelligent humans and um, okay maybe i will also go to des and see what you think about it data you know, goes back to that phrase, rubbish in, rubbish out, uh, to politely put it uh, for Pink Crime TV. Um, I, can, I, I can talk of many conversations I've had with uh, transaction monitoring packages and companies where I've helped them to buy these or, or look at all the different packages that are available for their different transaction monitoring requirements. Uh, and probably one in three and i've probably talked to let's let up to a dozen different uh transaction monitoring uh providers I, and, and i'm guessing one in three or one in four of them have only uh, have only ever asked and bothered to ask me about a the business strategy what client country business is we're working in what our risk profile is or what is our product risk um and it seems that the majority of services out there seem the term just seem to say we use machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, and that should be enough for me to buy it which it's sorry that's the wrong approach um and the the answer to your question yes data is the most important part and it's actually the data tidy up that takes the time to be able to we we have data most financial institutions have data from many different systems you talk to the banks and the large institutions and i'm sure mark will agree you've got legacy systems still working with half the data it's not all in one place that could take a year or more to get everything into one place that works um and a quite a uh, perfect example i think if you if, if you'd like if you'd allow me um, the, the scenario I would talk about is, is these algorithms that look at suspicious transactions, for instance. If, if you look at the human being and the policeman, that the policeman knows that there's a certain corner of a certain road in a town where the, there is known to be selling of drugs on the street corners. Now, if you put artificial intelligence on there it would say that these are the these are the uh, points that you should be looking out and and it would bring out a suspicious transaction now 
if you had a, an alert, a, a human being there, and the human being sees witnesses, somebody who is who's known as a uh, drug dealer or a drug user, briefly exchanging items by hand. So that policeman thinks the logic here says the AI says it's a known street corner that uh, looks like it could possibly be uh, a match, an alert to say there's a drug deal going on because they've exchanged items by hand and the, the human being, the policeman in that instance, makes two observations. First, they note that the suspect that they've identified sees that police per policeman and they change direction and try to move away. But the passerby, the other person who exchanged um, something by hand, drops something on the floor so by the time the policeman gets there he looks at what's on the floor he picks up that item and notice notices that it's like a free sale thing for an item going on for a shop around the corner and the person's accepted it looked at it and just thrown it away now human in human individual can make those observations very very quickly because they have uh, an emotional and responsive uh, approach to what's in front of them. For me, uh, transaction monitoring systems that automatically just have a, a rule that says if it meets that criteria, it would have created an alert. That may be a long way around it, but I think that going back to your question about data, it's all very well having data, but you've got to put it into context and you've got to have a rational mind behind it. So for me, I don't think it's the holy grail and the answer to all your questions. I think it's actually needing to apply a better understanding on both sides of what you're looking at. It's a question of where it can be best used, isn't it? It's really good at compliance, which is a yes, no issue. Are we doing this? Did we do this? If we did, fine. If we didn't, then we're in trouble. But it's really bad at risk assessment because risk assessment is suspicion and that or that comes in with emotions yeah Definitely. and curiosity as well which is an emotional response yep so I, I, I don't really understand this how do i react to it that's the whole basis of the of, of everything to do with suspicion and risk management and, and risk assessment um and so that's something that machines cannot do they can fake it but they can't do it no, I know uh, it, you were in your past in internal audit, used to be a third line of defense, now it's the fourth line of defense. Um, what would you say you would be looking out for in your audit uh, of um, a, a tool like this? It's very difficult, Julian. Um, do you look to tick the box that the regulators give you? effectively that you are an independent assurance function the people are doing what they say they are doing the system is delivering what you expect it to deliver for example going back to this Nigel's point if everybody happens to be a very big supporter of a football team that's local to the area to this corner and everybody wears their t-shirts does this mean that according to the machine that's doing the learning that everybody who is a football supporter is a drug dealer. Uh, of course not. That's a human intervention. It's not necessarily one that machines pick up. Internal audit will need to know, the independent insurance will need to know what the actual learning process is. They will then need to be able to articulate it and to measure it. And the thing about self-learning systems is they very rapidly or can very rapidly spin off into the most bizarre areas where you don't expect them. I, I have to say I'm not a huge fan of the um, third line of defense, fourth line of defense theory. It's far too militaristic 
and applies to even or understood attacks on the system. Uh, we are moving into an area where you're looking much more like a Napoleonic defense, which is you concentrate your sources independently of the front office and deploy them to where you can make the most difference. And I'm not sure that that would give the regulatory uh, control system the assurance that it needs. So in short, I think this is a new series of issues or, or issues that require new thinking, which I don't think is public yet. But I shall bow to Des and yourself and Nigel as to whether you think people have been thinking along how do we get that independent assurance in a rapidly evolving new tool. Can I take what you've just said one stage further, which is that we're talking about internal audit, but what about um, monitoring and money laundering systems audit, which is not internal audit? Um, are those people supposed to understand what's in that black box? I say yes. Are they supposed to be able to please what's in that black box? I say yes. What are we supposed to, how, are the, how is the ordinary money laundering reporting officer supposed to do that? And more importantly, how are those monitors supposed to be able to understand how that black box functions when every time they say to the provider, I need to understand this, and they say, whoa, it's a black box, proprietary information, you can't have that. Yeah, that's a really good point, Nigel. What I think that I would really like to do is that in one of the episodes to also talk about the black box a little bit more and how we can ask the right questions to know what exactly is in the black box rather than to just accept when people say, this is proprietary, it's not for you to know. So with that, thank you, gentlemen, and we I shall see you again in the next episode.